Okay? All right, we're going to begin. Um, it is late in the afternoon. I am aware. Uh, I don't want to lose too many of you. I think we still have an interesting discussion that remains to culminate uh, this terrific conference. Having said that, I'm aware that we have a bit of a tough brief. Uh, after a day of some uh, rather soaring geopolitics um, and strategy and policy questions, um, it is left to us to offer the industry perspective on these issues, which one might worry, I suppose I do a little bit, um, will come off as a grimy and mercenary uh, a resolution to, these, to this soaring geopolitical day. Instead, however, um, I would like to set up the conversation by suggesting the following, and that is that spending money alone is not an industrial strategy that is going to create these systems, which are at the center of the conversations we've been having today, not, certainly not effective ones. Um, uh, indeed, an industrial strategy that um, befits the imperative of missile defense would be something far more sophisticated than merely, merely the intention and the, and the will and, 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 and indeed the treasury to spend money, but it, would, it has more to do with orchestrating industrial resources and the incentives that engage them uh, in order to achieve these, these, these things. Indeed, I, I'd go so far as to say if we cannot, uh, as, as industry, not that I represent industry, but let's say for the purposes of this conversation, if industry cannot accelerate the time uh, across which these problems can be solved, these, these albeit technical problems can be solved, uh, reduce their costs, improve the performance both of existing systems and also innovate the performance of the concept of missile defense, um, all of the geopolitics and diplomacy will only be harder. Um, so uh, an industrial strategy, worth the words, uh, that instead accelerates time, reduces costs, improve, perf improves performance, and innovates is actually rather central um, to solving uh, the problem of, of, of missile defense that has been the overall uh, discussion for the day. Uh, I have here, if you accept that premise, please, uh, I have here today on, on this panel uh, two gentlemen who could not be more well uh, situated to address these questions uh, because their own careers uh, uh, show they have modulated between positions of important uh, policy responsibility in government um, and in business. Uh, and, and I will uh, introduce them both to make those credentials clear to you. Um, I should also point out uh, that uh, you're, we're missing a panelist, you may have noticed, uh, Tom Darcy. Uh, Tom has fallen ill and uh, told us earlier in the day that as much as he would like to be here, he is unable. Um, I conferred with my panelists here, and we felt confident uh, that we could carry on uh, without, without him. I'll say we, everything that needs to be said about EADS. Exactly, and that, and that Edgar would, would carry what water needed to be carried so far as uh, EADS is concerned. Um, uh, I did not introduce myself, perhaps. I'm Steve Grundman. I'm the M.A. and George Lund Fellow for Emerging Defense Challenges here at the Atlantic Council within the Scowcroft Center. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, introduce my two panelists. They will each have some remarks to be made. I might have a question for them, and then we'll turn to the audience, but you all can rest assured we will surely end uh, by 4.15. Uh, John Rood is the uh, Vice President for Business Development at Raytheon, or a Vice President for Business Development at Raytheon, uh, a position that he has held since 2009, uh, before which, uh, for the last two years of the Bush administration, Bush 43 administration, he was the Acting Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Um, he actually has a long career in government that that was the culmination of, which includes, among other uh, assignments, uh, two tours on the National Security Council res with responsibilities for proliferation uh, and counter-proliferation counter strategy. Uh, I think, if I'm correct, uh, he started his long government career uh, on the staff uh, of the professional staff of the U.S. Senate. Uh, Edgar Buckley. Um, Edgar is now uh, the principal of, I think, his namesake, E.V. Buckley Consulting. Uh, I got to know Edgar uh, over the period between 2003 and a year or two ago uh, when he was the senior vice president for, Europe, uh, for European business development at Thales. Uh, he was then based in Paris. I think you're now based in London, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, but before which, as I said, both these gentlemen have experience on both sides of the table, <coughs> proverbial. Um, before which, uh, uh, Edgar served in uh, the Ministry of Defense of the United Kingdom. 
um, and ultimately was lent over to NATO, where he served as the Assistant Secretary General for Defense Planning and Operations under Lord Robertson. So as you can tell from their backgrounds, each of them, I think, can modulate between the two sides of the conversation that uh, I hope that we can have here and uh, create a fitting culmination uh, to this terrific conference uh, rather than a grimy mercenary one. I will turn first to John, if I may, to offer up some uh, introductory remarks. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Steve, for that uh, introduction. And it's good to look around the room and see a number of folks that I've had the opportunity to serve with or work with in various capacities. So it's terrific to be here. I also want to thank the Atlanta Council and Barry and Ian for uh, pulling this together so nicely. It's been a good day to hear uh, so much of the discussion. Now, I've, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've had the good fortune to be involved in missile defense policy from a number of different aspects. Uh, began my career actually at CIA as a missile analyst following uh, missile programs like those in North Korea and Iraq and other states. I went from there to uh, serve for Senator Kyle as a Senate staffer in the 1990s. And then, of course, as mentioned, at uh, the National Security Council, Defense Department, State Department, and other roles. And then finally, as an industry official at Raytheon. And one of the things that is apparent to me from that is just how far we have come during the discussion. As I listened to the discussion earlier today, it was interesting to me to put into context where those various uh, inflection points have occurred. Um, as I mentioned, I had the good fortune to come to Washington 25 years ago, and I thought I'd be here a short time. And I got involved as a CIA analyst on missile programs, and I thought that might last a short period of time. I've now moved to different positions to see that. And, and in looking at, for example, in those heady days early, when the Tapo Dong 2 and other programs were new, and I recall going to brief the being sent to brief the Secretary of State and the Chairman of Joint Chiefs and others about these new developments that we had uncovered. And to see how far that has come, and to fast forward later during tours in the White House under Steve Hadley and others, when we had to look at provocations, and, and Steve did a good job mentioning that, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, the missile defense system has been brought to alert to deal with deliberate provocations by the North Koreans. And it, Contrary to the kind of arguments I heard in the 1990s when we were fighting in the Congress as a staffer to establish as the national policy that missile defenses were not destabilizing and that we should have one, uh, we were able to activate that system and it prevented us from having to do things like consider preemption, consider moving forces to the region to provide retaliatory options that would prove destabilizing, to consider sending messages to the leadership of North Korea that might exacerbate the situation. Instead, missile defenses gave us additional options and proved stabilizing. Now, I, I'm mindful of the fact that later on, of course, the ABM Treaty stood in the way of some of those things, and I still have echoing in my head the arguments made by some that our withdrawal that we managed during my, my tour at the National Security Council would prove destabilizing and the worth of missile defenses would not be proven. <clears throat> it just shows you how far we've come in such a short period of time. Now undergirding that in, in my current experience is the impact that industry plays in all of this and firstly providing the capabilities that our governments utilize with their defense departments or their equivalents, but also in promoting the kind of cooperation which undergirded a lot of the discussion today between nations. Next Saturday, uh, March 23rd, marks the 30th anniversary of President Ronald Reagan's uh, Strategic Defense Initiative speech, which a lot of people look back on as one of the seminal moments in missile defense. And it led to a lot of the things that we're talking about today. I, I just wanted to read one excerpt from that speech because I think it's noteworthy to look in hindsight at how uh, prescient those comments were. President Reagan said, and I quote, I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished before the end of this century. It will take years, probably decades, of efforts on many fronts. There will be failures and setbacks, just as there will be successes and breakthroughs." End quotation. Uh, so, I mean, in the popular literature at the time, of course, seen as the SDI initiative not producing results, but if you look at Reagan's own words, of course, he foresaw that this would be many decades before you'd really have the kind of capabilities that we have today and benefit from. There have, of course, been failures and setbacks, but we've learned a lot from those, and the successes far outweigh the costs, in my view. These lessons that were learned are, are hard fought, and when I visit our centers of excellence in Raytheon, devoted to things such as 
uh, the standard missile three franchise or Patriot, and you talk to the people working on those systems, you realize just how many hard lessons they have learned over the years that we now make look easy, but all of that knowledge came at a cost and with great effort. As I mentioned, these, the capabilities provided by these systems really give our decision makers a lot more flexibility. Um, and in addition to the successes in, in proving stable in situations like the provocations the North Koreans created, it's also interesting to see the effect it's had on our alliances around the world. And, you know, Steve Hadley mentioned a good point, which I used to hear a lot when I went to NATO, that uh, will these systems work? Well, we're now going on 58 successful hit-to-kill intercepts, and I think it really has been put to bed, this notion that can these systems be made to work reliably? We've even had a couple of successful engagements with directed energy with the Airborne Laser Program. And we've seen missile defense technology uh, successfully protect key friends like Israel from real attacks and also be used in things such as the uh, Operation Enduring Freedom operations to protect our forces and allies. And in some cases, <coughs> allied systems like those operated by the Kuwaitis achieving kills on incoming missiles. Since Reagan's speech 30 years ago, there have also been a number of policy-related de developments that have really provided the space for industry to go and work in other areas. Um, prior to the lifting of the ABM Treaty, they were, uh, first of all, the deployment of missile defenses were prohibited to protect your country or cooperation with allies in a meaningful way. Uh, but the lifting of these restrictions allowed industry to have more creativity in the kinds of systems we might deploy. So, for example, some of the capabilities we've unleashed are things like launching on remote data, that is to say, perhaps a ship in the ocean, an Aegis vessel, unable to see the incoming missile with its radar on board the ship, but rather being able to rely on satellite sensor data, as we recently demonstrated in an engage on remote test, that really expands the battle space, expands the capability of that system that would not have been permissible under the ABM Treaty. We're also able to think about other innovative approaches for how we use X-band radars linked to both land and sea-based assets in a networked solution. Really uh, a chance for us uh, with our technical capabilities to explore the art of the possible. Uh, while protecting, uh, developing a, a ballistic missile defense system to protect the United States, the United States government has also made it its policy to work with friends and allies to get this key defensive capability in their hands. Uh, today, a remarkable number of nations have acquired or developed missile defenses, and still more, such as Poland and Turkey, are planning to do so. Uh, we believe that among American companies, nobody has more international missile defense capabilities or programs than Raytheon. For example, knowing that Patriot is helping to defend our Patriot consortium members, that the THAAD system will soon be on watch in the United Arab Emirates, who we saw their ambassador earlier today, or knowing that our cooperative program with Japan will result in a new interceptor for the Japanese fleet as well as for the American fleet, the SM-32A, we're very proud of that. The SM-32A program is <coughs> something we hold up as a model of international cooperation. I'm very proud of that program because I was involved in creating it when, during my tenure in the Defense Department when uh, we were negotiating both the placement of a radar, which now exists in Shiriki, a fine Raytheon product, I might add, the uh, an Tippy y 2 but also the start of a development program for a new interceptor for both the United States and the Japanese fleet. Uh, we've seen a number of benefits both to our uh, industrial base as well as to the warfighter that will come from that program. Uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is our partner. We work under contract with both MDA and the Ministry of Defense in Japan. Our ongoing relationship with uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries has been very well managed and uh, we're on track for a 2018 delivery of that system to the fleets. From an industry perspective and from the position of a prime contractor, these programs provide immense benefit to our industrial base as well as to the nations. Uh, first, they drive competition at the defense industrial supply base, which is a critical component of production of affordable products. Uh, we need these strong technical and industrial capabilities to keep pace with the threat. Steve Hadley mentioned this inexorable race between the offense and defense, and that certainly exists on missile defense. And so we need those strong technical industrial capabilities, and they don't come unless you exercise them. Secondly, these missile defense programs establish <coughs> strong industrial relationships among the United States and allied nations in a time of increasing global competition. Uh, these programs make affordable the development and deployment of real capability through burden sharing. 
uh, that might not otherwise not be possible due to the economic constraints. And finally, missile defenses against a shared threat drive improved relations both among allies on a bilateral basis as well as in multinational groupings, whether that be NATO, the GCC, or we would love to see some of those cooperative activities in Asia, although our last panel spoke of some of the difficulties there. I mentioned Patriot a moment ago, and the Patriot system has been uh, evolved and developed to have numerous capability and logistical improvements. Um, frankly, it's just not the same system that was deployed 10 years ago. Uh, for example, almost $400 million of improvements were made due to our last uh, cooperative venture with the United Arab Emirates uh, that substantially improved the system and made it more affordable. There are 12 countries that are members of the Patriot Consortium, so you see a number of nations pursuing that. Uh, those nations are the United States, the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Taiwan, Greece, Spain, South Korea, and the United Arab Emirates. So across the three years of operation for the United States military and across the globe, we see those capabilities employed to great effect. Future uh, customers would benefit from further improvements and upgrades. For example, in our NATO ally, Turkey, we have companies that have produced many of the components and parts of the system that we then uh, sold to the United Arab Emirates. Should we be successful in uh, pursuing Patriot cooperation with Turkey, we will substantially expand that industrial footprint with a number of other Turkish industrial opportunities and a substantial expansion there. Another key uh, policy development was NATO's decision in 2008 in Chicago to adopt territorial missile defense as a core alliance mission and to welcome the U.S. phase adaptive approach as a contribution to the defense of the alliance. NATO really recently demonstrated this commitment, of course, by deploying patriots operated by uh, forces from the Netherlands, Germany, and the United States to protect Turkey during the current uh, conflict in Syria. This decision is Chicago, along with the alliance, is interested in smart defense concepts such as pooling and sharing provides opportunities for industry to help NATO and individual allies think of innovative approaches for making the alliance's vision a reality. Uh, for example, working with industry, the alliance could consider a pool of missile defense capabilities shared by the alliance. Uh, by spreading the financial burden of developing and procuring these capabilities, NATO could efficiently build upon the protection provided by the phased adaptive approach. I recall a conversation when Edgar and I first met in, in Rome, the Italian defense minister at the time, a man named Martino, was, had an economics background. And I recall him speaking to us that evening uh, at the dinner, uh, Edgar, about the benefits of shared resources and saying he'd commissioned an analysis by the Italians that showed that they'd spent 15% of what they would have otherwise spent on their defense by being a member of NATO. Uh, very quantifiable uh, justification that he used domestically to say why it was so in Italy's interest to be a part of the alliance, and that certainly applies to missile defense capabilities such as a pool of SM3s or other capabilities. Uh, just this last week, uh, Raytheon's SM3 demonstrated a dual band data link that allowed a Dutch X-band radar uh, to communicate with S-band capabilities to allow for different navies to uh, operate the same system. Very important capability. Another innovative approach I've seen firsthand is the value of joint ventures. I'm fortunate to serve on the board of directors of a French-American joint venture called the Tallis Raytheon Systems Corporation. Uh, and there we, of course, are the provider as the prime contractor for NATO for the uh, Air Command and Control System, or AX system. All these developments are evidence that over the last 30 years there's been a growing recognition that missiles pose a, a threat of increasing compl uh, complexity and that industry needs to partner with government to deal with that threat. Recently, a senior American official told me that one of the things he appreciates most about industry is they have the expertise and the time, and I can underscore the second part, you do have a little more time than when you serve in government and you're just running flat, it feels like, that we have the time to creatively think about ways to provide important capabilities to provide cap uh, things such as missile defense ideas and capabilities. Raytheon's been a proud to be a part of these efforts, and we are really very excited about the possibilities the future may hold. And I'll just sum up by saying it's really in three areas. One, to build these strong technical industrial capabilities to counter the threat and the, the strong industrial base that we have in the United States and that we want to promote internationally with our partners is just the foundational critical element for that to occur. Secondly, to allow for burden sharing between friends and allies, to allow missile defenses to be affordable in the present <coughs> fiscal climate. We're going to have to focus more on that. And thirdly, 
to build industrial cooperation that brings allies and groupings of nations, whether that be NATO, the GCC, or other groupings in Asia, to allow those nations to come together, or even to do that bilaterally, where, for instance, in Poland, I think we've got a, a special period of time where, as someone that's been involved in trying to build that relationship, we've got an opening to do that again with Poland's interest in an integrated air and missile defense system for their nation. So let me stop there and just say thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you and certainly look forward to the question and answer period. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Edgar. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much and I enjoyed your remarks, John. I'm going to look at this from a uh, European perspective and I'm going to start off with some remarks about the strategic environment as now seen in Europe because I think um, in Europe we're we've entered what I've called a, a new age of pragmatism. Um, what I mean by that is that um, European governments uh, now recognize that they're facing um, serious security challenges on their periphery, uh, and these have the potential to destabilize their own security, their own societies in some cases, and uh, they're going to have to deal with these uh, crises, these problems, largely on their own, without the sort of automatic leadership from the United States that we used to take for granted. Now, I think we always knew that this day was going to come, but it's come, it's sort of crept up on us somehow. It's come sooner than we expected. Um, the other realization <coughs> is that whereas in the past we used to think that, oh, well, the European Union will deal with this, and we'll have some kind of European Union mechanism for EU-led operations. Uh, we now know that's not going to happen. Um, I think, at best, the European Union will have a supporting role in, in um, following up in crisis management. But um, uh, the main role of um, uh, c conducting real operations is going to uh, fall to uh, ad hoc coalitions of European countries who have the means and the political will and who feel the necessity uh, to act. Um, and then uh, they will have perhaps NATO. Uh, when it, I mean, sometimes NATO will be in the lead from the, from the outset, but uh, perhaps more often in the future it will, will not be. Uh, but NATO may come along later, as we saw in Libya, to provide uh, any necessary organizing structure. And NATO, rather than the European Union, will do that because it's NATO that most e easily engages the essential uh, support from the United States uh, to provide uh, mechanisms uh, without which the Europeans uh, can't manage all the aspects of even the limited military operations uh, that they have been managing um, in recent um, months and years. Now, if you link that strategic assessment to the financial crisis and uh, the reducing defense budgets in Europe, uh, what this means for the European allies is that they're increasingly focusing on the most needed defense capabilities and they're trying to find smart ways of making them available. Now, in this context, that immediately brings to mind uh, NATO's Smart Defence Initiative, which, as far as I understand, does not include missile defence, for reasons we can uh, speculate about. But it rests on the, uh, on the linked approaches of bilateral and multinational cooperation, uh, prioritising what you can do and what you can't do, specialising where necessary, and generally getting uh, better value for money uh, by working together. But against that background, how does missile defence fit in, so far as the Europeans are concerned? Well, I think it fits in rather well, because um, so far as NATO is concerned, I think Europe is in the front line when it comes to regional uh, missile defence threats from short and medium range uh, ballistic missiles. And if Europe is going to have the, confi <coughs> the confidence to conduct the sort of operations around its periphery, uh, that it may have to conduct, it will need, as uh, I think Jim Miller said, to be able to deploy its forces uh, without the fear of retaliation against those forces locally or against 
uh, the populations and cities um, back home. Um, now, the other aspect of all this is that missile defense is, uh, as Ellen Tauscher said, preeminently the sort of capability uh, which uh, requires uh, what we used to call a joint and combined approach, uh, based very much on cooperation, on synergies, coordination, specialization, trust, uh, mutual dependence. Now, all this together, I think, gives you some uh, explanation of why European governments uh, continue to support missile defense and why they continue to invest in it. But there are uh, other reasons as well. Um, for uh, sovereignty reasons, governments very much want to see this military capability deployed through NATO and not solely as a United States national system. That's the big difference between um, the pre-Obama administration approach and what we see now. And that was very important to get that right. And both governments and European defense companies want to ensure that the European defense technology base keeps up with the advanced technologies which are being developed uh, in this domain. Now, for all these reasons, uh, European industry, following uh, their customers, <coughs> tries to involve itself as much as possible in what is going on. Um, uh, Thales uh, is the company I was working for until um, just over 18 months ago, and I still have a consulting uh, arrangement with them. They've been engaged at several uh, levels. First of all, <coughs> the uh, Smart L radar uh, has become, uh, which is made by uh, Talis in the Netherlands, it's become more or less the NATO standard long range radar. It's deployed on ships of, of um, uh, the Netherlands, um, Denmark, Germany, United Kingdom, France, and Italy. <coughs> that radar has, it's, it's a very remarkable radar, um, has a very long range. And through changes to its algorithm and to the, uh, the antennas of that radar, it, its range has, has been fantastically increased. It now, it's now in the 1,000 kilometer range, that radar. Uh, and uh, un under a, a contract which has been let by the Netherlands government, uh, that will be productionized. <coughs> uh, it's already been uh, demonstrated to have a capability to track uh, incoming ballistic missiles. That was demonstrated in Hawaii in in 2006. Uh, in France and in Italy, uh, Thales is providing with MBDA the SAMP-T uh, interceptor, low-level interceptor. Um, that uh, Thales is providing the fire control, the radar, the command and control, architecture, the missile uh, electronics and the guidance systems. That, that interceptor uh, was tested uh, 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 over the Biscarros missile range uh, just um, six days ago and uh, had an effective, a very, very successful kill of a representative uh, theater uh, missile. So uh, we're very pleased with that and uh, we think that missile will complement Patriot, which is an excellent missile, in NATO's integrated air and missile defense. Talus Raytheon Systems, which John referred to, <coughs> he's on the board now. I used to be on the board of that company. It's a great company. <coughs> Uh, that's responsible for updating the French national air defense architecture, a US French company doing that. Um, and since 2006, both Talus and TRS have been involved in a team led by SAIC to build NATO's missile defense architecture and deploy its command and control back, uh, backbone across the alliance. Uh, TRS uh, played a key role in developing the interim BMD capability, which was referred to many times this morning, that capability is now operational. It's at Ramstein, and it is uh, controlling NATO's active fence operation with the Patriot missiles in Turkey. Um, as a further step, TRS, same company, is leading a transatlantic team to develop the initial full operational capability of that system. Uh, that's planned to be delivered in 2015 to, to, to meet the next phase of, of the EPAA. Uh, uh, finally, uh, both TALIS and TRS are contributing to the French national early warning capacity, which they've offered to NATO as the French contribution. Uh, TALIS is developing uh, the very long-range radar, 
uh, demonstrator, uh, together with the French National Research Institute. Uh, Talus Linear Space provided the satellite uh, platform for the Spiral um, Early Warning in Orbit experiment. Uh, that was done in partnership with Astrium, which is part of EADS. I said I'd mention EADS, didn't I? I've done that now. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and uh, both TALIS and TRS are contributing to the advanced studies for a new satellite and a, and a command and control system uh, linked to that for the, fu the French future early warning system. Now, all these uh, European systems and others uh, from European companies uh, mainly con contributing at the lower level and the early warning uh, part of the systems. They are genuine contributions to NATO's overall capability and they need to be given recognition as such. It's very important <coughs> that because we want to make sure that this is a, a, a NATO capability. Uh, we would like to see them fully integrated with US systems and deployed to uh, needed areas uh, when necessary. Um, from the point of view of European companies, uh, just like for any other uh, defence capability, we see exports as a vital path towards achieving an adequate return on investment for our efforts uh, so that we can continue to invest in the future. Uh, we see uh, opportunities to cooperate both in providing NATO capabilities and in addressing export markets where that's appropriate. Uh, for example, uh, I agree with what John said about the possibility of combining and integrating weapon systems and networking uh, US and European sensors and also creating this sort of pool of interceptors which he referred to. And we can do that uh, both in NATO and elsewhere. Uh, effective missile defence systems are not just going to be from one country, they're going to involve networking capabilities from different companies and different countries. We need to get on with that. Uh, were cooperation in missile defence eventually to include Russia, which would be a government decision, that would be welcomed in Europe, uh, I think we know that, as well as in the United States, uh, provided the terms were acceptable. Uh, and at the industrial level, I think companies would have no difficulty working with their Russian counterparts once the political framework was agreed. Uh, Talos has had very successful cooperation with Russian companies in the space domain, in the aerospace domain and in some limited defence fields. Uh, and since the most obvious area for missile defence cooperation with Russia would be in information sharing, uh, sensors, data fusion and command and control, TALIS and probably TRS would hope to play a role if NATO and Russia were ever to agree to cooperate. I think from the European industrial perspective, uh, the key messages I would like to finish with are uh, that, first of all, uh, NATO's missile defence at all layers and levels should continue to be built on transatlantic industrial teaming. Uh, this is needed not only for economic and defence industrial base reasons, but also for military efficiency, for, for sovereignty and for burden sharing. Uh, European companies have critical skills and capabilities to offer, and we intend to continue to be engaged in this market uh, both in support of national and NATO customers and through export, will be competing. It's good for us both. Uh, <coughs> we think NATO should procure common procurement of command and control elements uh, while welcoming all national contributions and they should provide support for systems integration. And finally, uh, transatlantic industry is ready to support cooperation at a more global level, in my view, uh, possibly including with Russia, if and when the moment is right. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you both. Mm. All right, we have about 20 minutes uh, for discussion, and um, I think I may kick the discussion off by asking the following uh, question. Uh, maybe as bluntly as this. Yeah, either in your experience, or if you want to speak uh, on behalf of your company or your clients, as the case may be, <laughs> Edgar. Is this an attractive market? Uh, the, the, the point here is um, to put into context, right, this whole conference has been dedicated to missile defense. And so for the last eight hours, there's been nothing more important uh, than missile defense. Um, but I would admit a skepticism as to whether this is, in the greater scheme, 
of, of uh, how limited resources are going to be allocated across all these ministries of defense, if this is a high enough priority for companies like yours and those you may represent to view this as an attractive market, something they're going to invest in. Is this an attractive market, missile defense? John? I'd certainly say so. I mean, I think for us at, at Raytheon, one of the things that, that makes it an attractive market, besides the fact that the size of it in the multiple nations is that it, we think it, it's something that plays to our strengths where you're trying to move the boundaries of technology ahead to provide additional capabilities and discrimination capabilities. I say discrimination in the sense of additional things that set the U.S. military or those of our friends and allies apart from their adversaries. I think that's certainly the case. And, uh, as I, if I step back in my former role, I think, uh, regrettably, one of the things that's very good for business is what's going on in places like North Korea and Iran, where you see the threat progressing. That has not always been the case, I should say, as a side. There were some programs I worked on that, thankfully, as a, in the early days of being an analyst, sound like quaint historical examples, like the Condor program between, at the time, Iraq, Egypt, and Argentina. It went the way of the Condor. That, that is gone. Those three nations are not in that business. There are other success stories. But regrettably, in some of the areas where we and our allies see the greatest threats, whether that's Iran or North Korea, you see a growth in the size and sophistication, and not just there, whether it be in China or elsewhere. And so giving our customers, cap our, the Defense Department or allied nations, militaries, capabilities to deal with those things certainly is something that's an area of good business. And trying to be innovative about that is something that plays more to our strengths in Raytheon than others. To be sure, they're, they're going to have a very dynamic marketplace, particularly with what's going on in this country. But that doesn't mean there isn't still going to be a priority. At whatever level our political leaders settle out here, someday the uh, political debate over things like sequestration, the role of government, will reach some new plateau that is more sustainable. And missile defense, as we think, will still be a priority at whatever resting point that may be. Edgar, your remarks already suggested uh, as much, but if you might amplify. Well, the defense business in, in Europe is different from the way it's run in the United States. Uh, in Europe, you have to take contracts at fixed prices, basically, and including development. You take a big risk when you mm -hmm. do business in Europe. And uh, John will know that the joint venture between Talis and, and Raytheon lost uh, uh, quite a lot of money on the AXE program. Mm -hmm. uh, we took the contract and uh, we ended up uh, developing something which uh, it was very difficult to get NATO to uh, finish defining, really. And we lost hundreds of millions of euros on that um, uh, project. Um, missile defense uh, gives us the opportunity to um, justify that investment because it's being built, so far as NATO command and control is concerned, largely on the skills and, in some cases, the software that we developed for ACTS. Uh, more generally, I think um, missile defence uh, meets uh, the criteria uh, that defence companies like to see when they invest in a market. It's, it's a, a long-term requirement uh, which is likely to um, uh, to remain relatively stable over time, and that gives us every incentive to invest in, in research and development and to build up um, software teams. And there's nothing more difficult than, uh, than developing large software programs. And uh, it, it, they really are uh, a challenge to any company that takes them on. I remember speaking to a um, uh, senior executive from Boeing about a very large um, software program they were involved in, which was even bigger than Axe, and eventually it collapsed under its own weight. Um, and we recognized the problems. But no, I think missile defense is uh, an attractive market. We're not making huge amounts of money out of it, but um, it, it does have a long-term perspective, which is something we like. Although one would ultimately have to make reasonable amounts of money on it in it, it, order yeah. to stick with it. Yes, it depends what end of it you're in. Um, Raytheon are in pretty much all ends of it. You know, they're making the interceptor, they're making the radars, uh, they're making the systems as well, including through TRS. Talus is more involved. It, it doesn't make the platform; it makes the guidance for the 
and the electronics for the platform. It makes radars and systems. So we're, we, we're pretty similar in many ways, but uh, we're doing business in Europe largely, and Raytheon is doing business in the United States. I think the terms over here are a little bit better. Uh, let me exercise the privilege of one more question, and then I will uh, be pleased to take questions from uh, those of you who, who remain. And it, it is this. Um, so the Polish government, as I think has been recited today, uh, has recently uh, made a, a $5 billion commitment ten. to... Uh, ten? That's what they said. $10 billion commitment to uh, develop a lower tier uh, ballistic missile defense system. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask each of you to put yourselves back in government. Imagine yourself in the Polish Ministry of Defense. What's an industrial strategy uh for most efficiently developing that system? Well, the first thing they're going to do is insist, as Martin told us, on some sort of local, uh, or rather Polish, in involvement in that program. That's mm -hmm. going to be a sine qua non, it's quite clear. Mm -hmm. And their own industry wouldn't accept anything less. And their own industry's political support will be necessary for that program to go through. So that, that's going to happen. Now, I'm whether sure. that's efficient or not, one might well, you know, say it, remains it does, to be seen, but it's a reasonable expectation. It's a, it's a reasonable expectation, and I think uh, defense companies recognize that that is the way these things are likely mm -hmm. to go. Uh, you then have to uh, make that as efficient as, as, as possible. And certainly, um, uh, companies like Raytheon and Talos are very well versed in how to do that. Uh, and how to select local partners, how to qualify them, how to give them appropriate um, elements of, of the work and to make that as efficient as possible. It can work very well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of experience in doing that. Uh, the next thing I would do if I was in the Polish Ministry of Defence was make sure there was a good competition. And, uh, uh, you know, competition is good for everybody. Competition tends to be correlated with efficiency, all other it, things being equal. It's good for the customer, at least, and uh, I'm sure when it comes to that, they'll get the best prices. Uh, you need to be careful how you go with that, because um, uh, as you yourself said, Steve, at the end of the day, the contractor has to make profit, and if you drive the price too low, you, you can have trouble as well. Um, but I think uh, there's no reason why they, they shouldn't have a very good competition and get an excellent product from whichever company wins. Anything? Well, it, if I was in the Polish government, and I, I sometimes felt like I was, I visited so often <laughs> when I was in government. But all that being said, I mean, you start with a grounding in the fact that what is your threat perception and what capabilities does your military need? And in Poland's case, they both want them for a national defense as well as, frankly, to cooperate in NATO missions uh, elsewhere, whether that yeah. be in a future conflict area where the adversary has ballistic missiles. And they've played the Polish military a substantial role in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And so this is not a, uh, a notional idea. This is right. something they see as core to their identity as a growing power in Central Europe. In their case, I think they need the, the cutting edge capability, they need the best that they can get in this particular area. Polish economy has given them the benefit of being able to afford the best, and, and in their shoes, I would want the best capability to be provided and to be something that could be integrated effectively with NATO. That In their defense concept, they don't see themselves fighting without NATO, nor should they, candidly. And so uh, I would think in terms of how do I get more than just my individual national capability, but how do I integrate well? with NATO, and then the other part is build this relationship with the United States, and that's one of the great things these large defense programs give you, is there are ups and downs in political uh, administrations and, and policies in the United States, and to a certain extent, when you're in a senior position in the government, it's very difficult, the U.S. government, for you to keep a focus on a single area or on a single issue for very long. I mean, General Sharp, I imagine in your tenure in the Joint Staff, <coughs> you were pulled 10 different ways in a given week with major crises, and it will generally always be that way in the United States. But these large defense programs create a foundation for cooperation that binds militaries and other things together. When I would visit Japan, I was struck by the fact that the closest relationship the Japanese military and the U.S. military had was between their navies. Frankly, our navy was closer to the Japanese navy than they were to the United States Army, and vice versa. They could operate seamlessly. That's what you get from that kind of cooperation. With regard to defense cooperation, if I were in the Polish government, it's presumptuous of me to say this, 
I would, but that was my premise, so I, I, I would not uh, focus necessarily on something where I wanted to add a peanut butter thin layer to replicate all parts of the system, but I would choose some areas that maximize the strength of my industry that fit in an organic way with my partner's capabilities to be a part of not only local production of the system to be used in Poland, but ideally, say, in a, a system like Patriot, where there are 12 countries and others to be deployed, just to pick a hypothetical. Just to pick a hypothetical. To be, to be a part of its export to other countries so that the health of my industrial base continues to grow with the export of that system and its maintenance in the United States Army and things of that nature. And I think um, all of these things are certainly possible. Uh, to Edgar's comments, uh, uh, competition is actually in everyone's interest and that that be a very open one that is formal and with a lot of transparency. Um, Polish government is trying very hard to do that, uh, and that was not always the case in Poland, and they'd be the first ones to say that. And so I think that that's very important that they continue that, and it will correct perhaps some issues that, that we haven't developed yet, but it'll prevent the emergence of them if they stick to their, their formal policies. If, if I might just say, Please. And if I was in the Polish government and John came to see me, um, representing Raytheon now, and he said that... Um, buying the Patriot missile would help to strengthen the, the cooperation between Poland and the United States, I would say, what, you mean strengthen it more than it already is with our cooperation in the uh, missile defense program through the uh, Patriot battery that we, we're going to get? Right. Uh, uh, and are you suggesting, John, I would say to you, that if we don't buy the Patriot missile, somehow the US-Polish cooperation uh, would, would be lessened? To which you'd say, no, of course not. I'd say it'd be and an opportunity missed. That's the way I deal with missed. that. I'd say, it'd be, I'd say it'd be an opportunity missed. Uh, I mean, in all candor, it's just an opportunity cost. Whereas if they bought the SAM-T missile, you see, not only would they have great cooperation with the United <laughs> States, but they'd have great cooperation with France and Italy as well. This is and where I was headed. And would be contributing to NATO integration. Uh, questions? Byron Callan. Uh, hold one second and introduce yourself, please, when you get the mic. Sure, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. John, I think you mentioned directed energy, and I just want to explore, is there a disruptive technology in the next 10 years that's really going to change this basic paradigm of fairly expensive solid propellant uh, interceptors that really could change the economics of exchange in, in this missile defense equation? Perhaps. There are a number of, of technical innovations that, uh, that have occurred in, in recent years that are trying to therefore be applied to missile defense. You mentioned directed energy, and there are a number of different forms of directed energy. That's, that's very promising. If you could uh, make it tactically effective, uh, then you could change the cost per shot from, say, $10,000 for the defense versus uh, you know, a couple million dollars for the offense. Easy to say, very hard to do. I, I will comment, lasers are the only technology in my lifespan that the advances have not come faster than predicted. Every other technology I read about, it showed up on my doorstep. I mean, I used to think when I went on the family vacation, wouldn't it be great to watch television in the car? Well, my children do that now when we go on a road trip. But lasers uh, have not proven to be very easy to make into a solid state form and to operate in the atmosphere with a lot of water and other things. There are other thoughts, electric rail gun, um, high power microwave, and, and I think in some way, which I cannot frankly predict as, a, as somebody that's an observer of technology, which one of those will bear fruit or if it's something else. But that is one of the signs of the emerging missile defense debate is that we've frankly moved on from can it be done in a one-on-one -on -one or a few on a few capability to more sophisticated levels of discussion about exchange ratios, cost effectiveness, things of that nature, which are so common with air defense or a, uh, capabilities in anti-tank weaponry or other forms of warfare. So I think you're right. We will see some of that, and, and there is R&D spending being conducted both by companies and governments that I, I think will show some promise, but it's just hard to predict exactly when that will occur. I agree. On that? Uh, we, we're doing research on it, but uh, it's a long way off. All right. Other questions here within the audience? General Sharp. Uh, one, please, grab the microphone. Thank, Thank you. you. I've really talked about what it's going to take to be able to help technology in other countries to be able to sell things to other countries. And I'm sure when other countries look at this, they look at it from a capability perspective, a cost perspective of when it can be delivered. But what we've all been touching on here is also what technology transfer 
to be enable to enable the defense industries within those countries, and how does a country balance all that together? So my question, and John, if you could look at it from both sides, is Raytheon and SM3 seems to have been very successful at joint ventures, at working cooperation with other countries and other international companies. Is there a lesson or two learned out of how you all did it that made that successful? And maybe a follow-on to both of you is, are there any key policies or procedures that we, the U.S. government, have that restrict our ability to be able to even enhance that more that you all would recommend that the U.S. government take a look at changing to be able to establish more joint ventures, more capability worldwide? Thank you. I think there's a there's a number of lessons learned. The export control regulations and technology transfer regulations are an obvious uh, limiter as to where you can go. And as somebody that used to oversee and the administration of those, I'm not in the category that says it's a fundamentally flawed system or it's a bad system. They have good reasons for those. Now they don't always get applied as you go down in ways that we're all proud of. Uh, having when I served in my last role occasionally when companies would come to see you and they begin their pitch about some issue they're encountering with your regulation, you know, that, that cold shiver that goes down your spine when you realize, oh God, you know, this might be kind of embarrassing what we've, how we've applied our own rules. There are instances like that. I think some of the moves to make this a more simple system and also to bear in mind that um, for missile defenses, this is something the United States government is trying to encourage, but you don't see that really reflected in these, these technology transfer policies or any active effort. I, I will say, I mean, in, in some cases, it's, it's a little bit neglectful how um, we've approached that. And, and I mean, not by design, just application. It's a large government, and as you know, it's, we always struggle to get everyone organized, but I think, um, unfortunately, we're moving to a different phase of our fiscal life. I like. Edgar's description of an age of pragmatism, that there needs to be a little bit more of an application of that. And I will say in, in Japan, one of the things that helped us is uh, another country with a very similar export control system, very stable export controls. They don't re-export as a national policy to others. So that, that helped. But even in the industrial cooperation there, I will say there are things that you learn by doing this over and over with other countries that um, the way our Japanese colleagues approach some design activities and other areas, until we got more relief from some of the subsidiary restrictions, not export controls, but at each level, there's the government to government agreement, then there's the Defense Department trade uh, technology export controls, then there's your managing agency imposing certain management controls. Layer all those things on, in some ways it hindered an integrated management of the system. And that can cost a lot of time and a lot of money, and it was only by getting some uh, government attention to resolve some of the issues that, are, that had arisen that we could do that. Certainly in the Talos Raytheon case, the French and American governments have different export control systems. Try developing an integrated software system of the complexity of ACTS, mm. where there are firewalls which are intended to prevent the complete sharing of knowledge among software engineers. Very, very difficult to do. I will say in the macro sense, as a, as a government official, these sort of uh, programs are very hard to birth. In the industry, they're very hard to execute. I still think they're worth it uh, in the end because of what they produce. But they are much more complicated than the average uh, army program or something of that nature. Edgar, do you have anything yeah. to add by way of lessons from international well, partnerships? I would say that um, European companies are more used to um, operating um, abroad if I can put it that way, than our American companies. Raytheon is a notable exception, in fact. Um, most American companies don't do as much business uh, in export as Raytheon does. Um, many are doing less than sort of 8 9% of their turnover in, in export. Um, European companies like Talos have got vast experience of operating joint ventures um, with uh, companies in other markets, and it's, in fact, their strategy Talos' strategy was to do that, and they did it in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in Italy, in Sweden, in Denmark, um, in Australia, in South Africa, you know, they, 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 the string of these things, and they know exactly how to do it. And then when it comes to uh, export, pure export, where you don't have a joint venture, they now have a system, what they call key industrial partnerships, where 
you go into a country and you find yourself a, an industrial partner who can uh, build some part of your product and you've tried to form a long-term relationship with that partner uh, which will stand you in, in good stead over a number of, of exports. And that seems to be working quite well. So far as export controls are concerned, uh, the United States certainly does make life difficult for US exporters and for companies trying to integrate US products, uh, uh, US parts uh, in, in their products. Uh, I mean, the, but that is, it, there, there's been a fantastic effort to improve that, and I would pay tribute to all those who've been involved in, in, in improving it. It's not finished. There's still, um, as John said, the, you, you find some, uh, some examples of where it's gone badly wrong, but um, it's more difficult with the US export control rules than with anybody else's. But then US, US technology is perhaps a little bit more sensitive than anybody else's as well, in some ways looked at in the broad. Any other questions? This gentleman right here, please. Introduce yourself, if you would. Thank you. Uh, Jean-François Pactet, visiting fellow in the CSIS. Uh, I have a question. One issue which was discussed earlier was the question of saturation of the defense. And, uh, of course, from your point of view, the answer is probably to buy more interceptors, except there is also a limit to that from the point of view of funding. Uh, I wonder if, in your experience, the governments you are dealing with have given some thought to this question of what is the right number of interceptors to have, uh, and what uh, if uh, has this issue been uh, been discussed in, in in your experience? Well, I mean, my uh, sense would be when you're depending on the circumstance. Uh, it'll yield different answers as to what the greatest capability it need for a country is. But I really think you have to look at missile defenses as a system. Increasingly, by the way, we have to look at them not as a system only for defense, but the integration with offensive capabilities, including non-kinetic. Those things, that's the growth area in strategic thought, is how to seamlessly blend those things. Uh, and, you know, as an example, I, I've participated in lots of war games in the U.S. Defense Department, but they were typically the defense fighting the offense. I mean, we would intercept different missiles. Start to introduce offense or other capabilities. It gets very, very complicated very quickly. Um, in, so it would depend on the country involved and the system as to whether their greatest need is uh, greater sensors early. So for example, one of the things that I thought uh, was a, a good point about the way the Iron Dome system operated in Israel is it did not seek to shoot down most of the missiles fired at Israel because of the uh, ability to determine where they were going and to make intelligent decisions about which ones didn't pose a threat and to, therefore to conserve uh, interceptors. So uh, that's one area of sensors. It may well be that your command and control network and sometimes when we do system modeling, what's most needed is to improve the speed at which you can move that data and you can make decisions because Otherwise, having all the interceptors in the world uh, 10 times your current magazine would not provide the benefit that you want. And so really, I, I think you have to look at a system-wide approach and how you approach that. Now, that's the other area where it lends itself if we're able to identify ways to do that and evolve our thinking to have more partnerships among nations to do that because then you can play to the given strengths of a particular country uh, and the niche uh, capability that their, some of their industry sectors might have to actually increase the overall system capability beyond perhaps what just the standard issue equipment would be. Uh, I agree with that. I think the efficiency of the system